Tonight in WECT's first documentary, a side of our community you have never seen, perhaps one you thought couldn't possibly exist. The Cape Fear region, we're known for our scenery, our beaches and historic downtown. We're also known for having one of the highest overdose death rates in all of North Carolina and being a big name on what's called the Heroin Highway, nonstop corridor north to south that brings in tens of thousands of bags of heroin into our neighborhoods. Tonight, the veil comes off. Over the next hour, you'll see footage you won't believe was shot here, but it was. You'll see people shooting up in parking lots you've been in. A woman injecting herself while driving down a road you've been down and countless used syringes in places you've walked through. Give us your undivided attention for the next hour. You are not going to like what you see. But heroin isn't an addict's problem. It's not somebody else's problem. It's everyone's problem. And we're about to show you why. like the downtown area, great restaurants, great beach. We're looking forward to what should be a beautiful sunset today. Great southern hospitality. So. Food here, the people here, very nice. And, and it should be beautiful for each minute. Happy Boulevard, whiskey in our vehicle. Just put the right foot in front of the other. Uh, Do you have any more dope on you? 30 40 bags a day. Some There's two damn needles in there. Yeah. There's 15 needles in each bag. I don't have anything on it. Here's where I am. Yeah, come on. I think he's doing a bag right now. There's a world where you have your blinders on and you, you have no idea that this is going on. And then there's a whole other world here where this is a major problem. Avatar. There is a lot of heroin in this city. There is a lot of users in the city, and it's happening daily, right out in the open. Special Unit Special Attention is 3 Alpha. Happy Boulevard at Honda Court, swerving over the road. See, man, I asked you if you had any other needles. Heroin is the, the new crack for this area. Yellow. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that. What is that, eight? 110 people that I could go to right now and buy heroin from in this town. We have seen every age from 15 years old to 75 years old, uh, man, woman, child, um, every race, color, and creed you can imagine. There's, it, it has no boundary. If they've already have the heroin on them and they need a needle, they'll pull up, run into a pharmacy, find the syringes, buy the syringes, run back to the car, and before anybody knows what's happening, they're pretty much already shooting up heroin within 30 to 45 seconds. All right, he's got a needle, let's get out. You just tell them what size and they'll give them to you. It's like $3.30 or something for a pack. Step out, step out. I've seen people 
put stuff inside of them, if that makes sense. But just certain spots in cars that they would not expect police to search. Ah, I got it. We're finding used needles, capsta needles. We're finding used heroin bags. Uh, there's, it's a never ending cycle. I myself have been stuck about 15 years ago. I was searching underneath the seat of a car. When I brought my arm out, it was actually hanging from my forearm. When we pull up on them to investigate what they're doing, they're completely passed out at the steering wheel, foot on the brake, still in drive, needle still in their arm. And then we've also had people that have shot up bags of heroin and before we could get to them to stop them from getting on the road, have gone on the road and driven perfectly fine and normal. Last thing I really remember is kind of just like, sounded kind of like a train coming behind you, but it was a pickup truck. I didn't see it coming. I didn't see it in my rear view or anything like that. A witness had seen them uh, nodding off in the Walmart parking lot. If anyone had been in my back seat, they would have been killed. So when they hit me, my trunk pretty much went into my back seat. If you've got an addiction, I pray and hope you get help. But wait till you get home or where you're going to be somewhere for a long time before you're on the road driving, nodding off, putting other people at risk. with bags that have been going around that have been killing people up here. That's what addicts want, are those bags, because they're the potent, most potent. A lot of time as drug investigators, we get hung up on the amount of drugs we're seizing or we're high-fiving on great busts or great seizures. But the loss of life due to a drug that we are in charge of combating on a daily basis is a hard thing to swallow. All it takes is one bad bag and you're dead. Six months of footage boiled down to a few minutes. And still, what you just saw is but a snapshot of heroin use here. Addicts will tell you, there's just as many doctors, nurses, lawyers, and CEOs getting high on dope as there are people doing it in parking lots. So stop yourself if at any point you thought, I would never do that. Most every user we met over the past few months said the same thing. People like Abby. She's a PTA mom, had a great job, and then she had to take her son off life support. Abby didn't look for heroin, but it certainly found her. If you can't relate to her story, maybe you'll understand Cortland's. His addiction started with a pill that most of us have in our medicine cabinets, making you no more immune than any other addict who thought, this could never happen to me. From the moment I knew my son was coming to the world, I spent 10 years of my life planning our future. And in a moment's time, it was taken from me. I came really close to committing suicide. As soon as I would feel that pain, I would just want to numb it, and I started self-medicating. 
A friend introduced me to a little baggie with something in it. I said, snort this, you'll feel better. It was heroin. It just seemed to take me somewhere else where I wasn't constantly hurting inside. I didn't know how, how to live. I did think that that was my saving grace and I even thought that it may have saved my life. I had gotten in a bad car wreck and I was prescribed prescription meds for pain pills. pain was, was just hammered on everyone. And this notion, I think that we were falsely gonna get their pain to a zero. All of a sudden you have people who come in with a simple little ankle sprain, walking out with a, you know, a, a week supply worth of whatever opiate. They find quickly that they're the cheaper source initially. They can buy heroin for half the cost, maybe a third of the cost, what their pills were. So initially, it's a great thing for them. You feel like you are on top of the world, that you are untouchable, um, that nothing can hurt you. All right, so this is what the bags look like that I'm about to do. They come in bags. 30 bags a day is what it got up to. How much money is that a day? Um, that's about $200 a day. So that's a $1,400 a week habit. This is me relapsing right now as we speak. To use heroin on a regular basis is a full-time job. You're going to lose everything you have because you have to support your addiction every single day. They're pawning everything they have. Uh, some people, unfortunately, are stealing from their families. The girls, they, they have a different way of getting heroin. I'm not gonna go into specifics, but they don't necessarily have to go out and rob. You okay? As an addict, normal is the drug in your body. And when you do not have it, you are sick. Man, there's a hallway. Sometimes it hurts so bad. You can feel your hair hurting. You will not stop until you get that fix. The sickness is like almost want to kill yourself. I was new to the game and thank God I never got old to the game. Yeah, I was a horrible criminal. <laughs> and thank God I got caught. That's stop the world. I mean, the, liter literally, the world quit turning. Thank God for him. And I was doing 12-step programs up here, but then something would throw me off, and you'll justify it to go get high. It's got me three felonies on my record. It's got my family to where they don't even know if I'm telling the truth or if I'm lying. Uh, here it goes. It's destroyed everything that I've ever had. All right, now I'm officially high as hell. It's taken everything from my life, and when I say that, I mean everything.
Fortunately, right now I'm sober, and that's great, but it's like, that could change in five minutes. And like, that's the scary part. Abby can tell her story looking back, but Cortland, after being on MTV's show Teen Mom, his addiction will forever haunt him online. Anyone can push play on the videos and pictures taken during some of his biggest struggles. Both of them credit the support system they had to helping them find sobriety. You can't lock addicts up in a room and let them sweat it out. But look no further than the ER if you want to know where most end up. Line them up at 13th and oh, she's got a whole thing of syringes. Yeah, she was shooting up, putting uh, the heroin in the needle. They say that your addiction's in the parking lot doing push-ups. Needles. Well, that's not true. Your addiction's in the parking lot, and he's, he's already done his push-ups. It's very important that we realize this is not people having lots of fun on a roller coaster. It's, it's a predictable but very scary and painful process to become addicted to heroin. I mean, how long does it go, but... It's a cycle that oftentimes people are desperate to find solutions for. There needs to be at least 10 treatment centers in this town. I think that can be an excuse. People don't want to quit using it until consequences come about. Making it easier for people of all ages, all races, and all financial uh, status to get a treatment would be a big boon for Southeastern North Carolina. You know it's heroin because you see the track marks or because the person who rolled them out of the car at the back door said he, w he was shooting heroin and they peel off and you're left there with this blue unresponsive person. We're not a detox facility so the best we can do is you know help them with their symptoms at this point in time. And what that treatment would entail basically is uh, room and board and what um, medical care we can provide while we are working to try to get that patient into um, usually a state facility. <laughs> um, it can range from uh, 24 hours to, we've had people boarding in the, in the ED for weeks and um, you know, it's at a uh, tremendous cost. It definitely contributes to the overcrowding problem and takes up um, treatment space that we would otherwise be able to use for other medical concerns. And it creates that problem that we have in the emergency departments of people having to wait for care. This is truly an epidemic that is out of control. And Right now, we're, not, we're doing very little stop it as a country. Treatment centers hear it all the time. Cost of rehab, too high. But for perspective, consider that the average heroin user in our area spends about $80 a day on heroin. That's about $2,000 a month around $30,000 a year. Well, for those not yet ready to ask for help, there is a type of support that will actually drive that help to them. Syringe exchange programs try to make users the best addicts they can be, so to speak, reducing the harm caused to either themselves or anyone else. Trade in your used needles for a new supply, 
cut down on sharing and the spread of disease, and safely dispose of dirty needles, keeping them out of parking lots and playgrounds. That is the idea. So where is the syringe exchange program in our area? There isn't one. And finding the others is really on a need-to-know basis. We go to the drug motels off the highway and ask people point blank. Do you know somebody that's shooting up? Are you shooting up? Do you need some needles? Would you like some naloxone? Can I tell you about this to help protect you and everybody around you? The state of North Carolina, uh, for all intents and purposes, has abandoned the drug user and the addiction community. If you give somebody a clean syringe, if, you know, you're able to prevent a mass infection rate of HIV, of hepatitis, of all of these things that tend to destroy not just individuals, but families and communities. I've seen people actually go into that parking lot and find rigs that people have just thrown out. And they'll use it on themselves. So they could have just caught HIV, they could have just caught some disease, they don't even care. We generally distribute roughly between 1,000 and 2,000 syringes a month. If we think of addiction as bad people doing bad things, then we don't want to encourage. And so people are worried about needle exchange programs because they feel like they might be encouraging. Go directly in front of your left foot, heel to toe, and then stop. Sure. We don't want to make it easy for them. That's OK, man. We're okay for them to continue in a negative cycle, but we also don't want to lose them. We want them to be alive long enough to have the hope of recovery. The person we're taking them to, you know, just got out of jail. You know, I just take them up to them and then they distribute them to the people within their uh, user union. That's what we kind of call their little groups. They're like called user unions. There's 15 needles in each bag. Where a bunch of IV drug users get together and you know they tend to take care of each other, make sure nobody overdoses, you know, and use in a group to make sure that everybody's safe and, and stuff like that. There should be like 75 total. Some of these kids have overdosed six times. Love you, be careful, okay? Love you too. Pray for you. It breaks my heart to see kids that young. We're amassing an amount of used syringes that 
nobody will help us dispose of. When you ask somebody, hey, I've got 10,000 needles I need to dispose of, you know, people just are not willing to travel that road with you. They're just not. God, you know, he just won't let me rest. He won't. Because, you know, I think about the friends that I've lost and I think about, you know, the people that could be here today. You can't stop. You know, even in light of this illegal situation, even in light of a lack of resources, uh, you, you just can't, you just, you have to. It's an issue of, a society doing what we're called to do, and that's to care for each other. You know, and if nobody else does it, I'm still going to do it. Very few states and counties support syringe exchange programs, let alone fund them. And those that do battle public sentiment, people not wanting their tax dollars anywhere near them. That's ironic, because we're paying for the problem one way or the other. Consider the cost of hepatitis C medication, a disease driven by injectable drug use. In 2013, North Carolina shelled out eight million dollars paying for it, and more than 50 million the very next year. So where are we going from here? What's the plan? Is there a plan? And if there is, where do we start? The issue is becoming so prevalent and so obvious that it really is um, tantamount for all of us, healthcare providers, the community, law enforcement, for all of us to work together to find a solution to this problem because it's huge. What are you putting, 20 cc's in one bag? So I'd encourage people to get involved in community prevention efforts and then get involved in encouraging people into treatment. That's okay, we'll stop there. And not looking at that as so foreign but rather look at it as a, a part of what we put together in the fabric of our community. Again, until people make that decisions themselves, nothing can be done. It's never too late. You just have to want it. A bunch of tore up empty bag or what? Continued aggressive enforcement towards the largest dealers and traffickers that we have. Got to get them as much time in prison as we can to send a clear message to the community that we're not going away, that they're the ones that are going to have to go away. If I didn't have a lot of hope, I wouldn't sit here. That's our job. We give help to the helpless and hope to the hopeless, and we got to love these people until they start loving themselves again. I think that we're going to have to really rein in what we're doing, because until you get rid of the need, there's always going to be a supply there. If you have prescription medicines like that in your home, dispose of them or lock them up. Don't let them be accessible because typically that's where heroin use starts. I don't foresee any change occurring anytime soon. It's not going to go away. So we can wish it away. We can ignore it, we can act like it's not there, we can sit there and say, well, they're just drug addicts and they're not effective members of our society and if they die or overdose, you know, so what? I only do bags when I can't find pain pills. But the truth of the matter is, there is not a single family in this state, much less in this nation, that has not or will not be impacted by this issue.